Hello and welcome back. We're going to be starting our next talk now, who is going to be Connor Ross, who will be presenting to us today on Wit Signaling, a Pandora's Box. Connor, I'll let you take it away. Brilliant. Uh, thanks. Cheers, Dylan. Um, and thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity today to uh, talk to you about uh, a little bit about some of my research, um, but mainly a background to uh, my passions and research in this particular area. Um, so I'm by default a developmental biologist. I study both embryos and stem cells. Um, I've been really interested in this ever since I was quite a young boy, really. Um, and my main uh, aspects of research uh, involve trying to understand how cells communicate to each other with a particular focus on one mode of ancient communication, uh, which is wind signaling, which I'll talk about today. Um, so to give kind of a background to this, if my slides decide that they actually want to move. There we go. So uh, the overview of the talk is I'm going to quickly introduce um, development of the embryo in humans very briefly and stem cells, what they are and how we obtain them, and then move into talk a little bit about the history of the wind signaling pathway, uh, what we've learned from studying it in embryos and stem cells and its overarching implications in human disease and development, um, and then looking into a little bit more detail of how cells coordinate um, fate specification events, but also um, more basic looking at how uh, wind signaling goes wrong and how it underpins uh, diseases. Um, so to kind of overview this, uh, human development is rather quite astounding um, and we live in an age now where we can actually study this a lot more focused um, and it's really really cool. Uh, basically the gist of it is that uh, upon fertilization um, within the first uh, five days uh, the early embryo is first of all making its way um, through the fallopian tube towards the uterus and is undergoing a series of uh, divisions um, that allow it to uh, basically grow in size in preparation for implantation into the uterus. And around about the day five, the uh, embryo undergoes a stage of compactation and it forms something what we call a morula. And then over the next 24 hours, it expands to form a blastocyst, which is uh, shown here. And at this stage, there are two uh, main populations of, of cells. The first one of these pink cells here, these are um, they, they form the ICM, the inner cell mass, uh, and these contain the progenitors of the epiblast and the hyoblast, which are the two lineages that give rise to the embryo, the fetus, and then the underlying cells give rise to the, uh, to the yolk sac, which nourishes the uh, embryo during early development. And the uh, other cells around the outside, these are called trophoblast, and these cells are precursors of the placenta. So the embryo prior to implantation has the cells necessary to proceed. And then on day seven, the embryo begins to adhere to the, uh, the uterine lining of the mother and begins to embed and implant ready for the next stages of development. So that's what the cartoon looks like. This is what it looks like in real life. And these are IVF embryos. So you can see that during the first five days up until day five, five and a half, and then we get formation of this blastocyst. And then where this white arrow is pointing to demarcates this inner cell mass, which I showed you in the previous slide. And in here are the cells that uh, go on to form the embryo, which is shown here. Um, and this is where we get embryonic stem cells from. And then on day seven, the embryo literally hatches from this shell very similar um, is analogous to how a chicken will hatch from an egg or anything that hatches from an egg, basically. Uh, this is an analogous thing. Is this the, the, there's still this, this eggshell around the outside called the zona pellucida. The embryo then hatches and then attaches and implants. And this is a really nice image uh, of around about an eight, an eight or nine week um, embryo slash fetus, where at this stage you can see that it has uh, the eye, it has the beginning of an ear, and it has the limbs and then begin of the um, the fingers. And so at this stage, the uh, embryo slash fetus has all of its organs. And then from the ninth week onwards, when it is demarcated as a fetus, uh, the rest of uh, gestation, at least in humans, is dedicated solely to growth and the preparation for birth. And after birth is when a lot of changes uh, happen. <laughs> 
So one really important question is, well, you might, people would have generally heard is, you know, what is a stem cell? Um, you know, we see, we've seen it in the media uh, quite recently um, and they're, they're really quite exciting and they hold quite a lot of promise, which I'll describe uh, in the next slide. Um, but basically a stem cell <clears throat> in its purest form is a cell that can self-renew or divide for long periods of time and remain as an undifferentiated stem cell. Uh, they basically, they don't have any kind of fate they have their faith bestowed on them via cell signaling um, pathways and their uh, ability to communicate between the cells. And the other feature of this is that in doing so, they can differentiate. So we can take a stem cell um, in the lab and we can push it and make it form liver cells, heart cells, cells of the eye, cells of the inner ear, cells of the teeth, you, you name it, we can now we can pretty much do this. And the other quite important feature of stem cells is that whilst in their undifferentiated state, they remain competent to receive signals to then allow them to differentiate. And so in this diagram, you can see that they do one or two things which we term as either symmetric or asymmetric division. So in a, a, a symmetric division, they basically form two daughter cells of themselves, basically. And then you can have an asymmetric division where you have the stem cell will continuously divide in its undifferentiated state, doesn't have a fate, and then eventually a cell um, comes and it has a fate. It begins to differentiate into a certain kind of cell. So because of this and the fact that we can culture these stem cells for long periods of time and they can form lots of other different cells, they hold great promise uh, for regenerative medicine and basically cells to study um, human development outside of the embryo that would be otherwise inaccessible. And some of these things that we can use stem cells for is to understand how birth defects occur within the DNA. We can create all these different cell types as I kind of highlighted previously um, for transplantation in, in the future. Um, we're kind of just starting to step into that uh, window now. And then we primarily use the stem cells um, as, a, as a tool to look at drugs and understand how drugs interact with tissues um, and understand how we can uh, tailor drugs to specific individuals. So the stem cells hold a lot of promise, but there's a lot of things that we're still quite far away from doing. Um, like I say, transplantation, we're looking more into it. Scientists who work in this field more specifically are looking into this. Um, but there's still a lot of things that realistically need to be understood about these cells before we can start, you know, kind of pumping them into people, really. Um, so we, we kind of we know what the stem cells are and we know that they can differentiate and they remain as stem cells in the lab. And there's a rich history um, to the background of stem cells. And this is a, a nice diagram and a roadmap to it. Um, and there are several different types of stem cells that exist. The original stem cells um, that were kind of well characterized back in the day um, in somewhat of a basic form, if you kind of look back compared to what it is now, were stem cells derived from the embryo. Um, and, you know, in the 1980s, this was first done in the mouse um, by Martin Evans and Matthew Kaufman. And they were able to derive embryonic stem cells straight from mouse embryos and culture them for long periods of time. And then it wasn't until 1998 when James Thompson's laboratory were able to derive um, cells of a slightly later stage um, from the human embryo, which was uh, quite a massive feat uh, for the stem cell field. And then even more so and more recently, uh, the work from Shina Yamanaka and his laboratory has demonstrated that actually what we can do now is we can take skin cells, uh, fibroblasts, and we can effectively reprogram them and switch their fate um, to then turn them back to pluripotent stem cells, which are termed induced pluripotent stem cells. And these can be then differentiated into, as I say, all these different types of tissues, and then they can be used as you know, treatments for therapy, and then they can also be used to screen drugs. And they, like I say, they hold a lot of promise. Um, the other type of stem cell that exists within uh, adult tissue, and this is something I'll describe a little bit later on in more detail, are these multipotent adult stem cells. So, for example, uh, your bone marrow contains stem, these multipotent stem cells, which allows them to differentiate into the blood. And basically, the whole point of these stem cells in um, adult tissues, these niche stem cells, as we call them, 
is the fact that they play a primary role in regeneration of uh, blood, uh, the intestines and things like that. And this is what I'll, I'll come back to. So one term that I threw around quite a bit there was pluripotency. Um, and this is the term that we associate uh, to these stem cells based on their capacity or ability to differentiate into cells. So uh, pluripotency is defined as the term that they can form all types of cells. Multipotent stem cells can only form a few types of cells. They're generally very restricted to what they can do. But if we fast forward time and move through the decades, a lot of work has been done to try to understand at least mouse embryonic stem cells in a lot more detail. Um, and the reason for this is that the original conditions which these stem cells were generated in uh, utilized uh, fetal bovine serum, which is uh, a blood component from um, bovine fetuses, which was spun down and then used. And they were all the, the stem cells cultured originally on inactivated skin cells from the mouse. And basically, in it together, they maintain stem cells in their pluripotent form, is what I said. But the problem then came to that the fetal bovine serum that was used um, was quite variable and it contained a lot of undefined growth factors. So it supported the stem cells, but we didn't know what it was doing. And then as we move through the time, a lot of fantastic work from uh, Jenny and Austin here, as uh, to know this is Jenny, my supervisor, um, reformulated a lot of the conditions and gradually over time, they moved away from using the uh, inactivated skin cells and eventually moved away from the FBS, even though the conditions are still used widely today. And then in 2008, 2009, uh, Austin's post, uh, postdoc at the time, Ki Long Ying, uh, generated a completely defined culture medium for these embryonic stem cells. And then this is what we, we come to really. Um, so the process originally was that you take a, a, an embryo, a mouse embryo, and you plate it down. And then this blob here in the middle is the inner cell mass, what I described before. And then eventually it grows. And then uh, Jenny, the majority of this kind of work is you were able to take this, um, this inner cell mass outgrowth and you would dissociate it with it very gently and then eventually you start to get these little baby colonies arising um which is again obviously really really cool and then if we fast forward time again to 2015 to 2016 this is the story around about from this time and, and, and progressing onwards um uh, jenny and, and help from uh, gregoire um they were able to uh generate and derive embryonic stem cells of a similar stage in the mouse uh, from human embryos. So uh, if we look through this, this is this is a day uh, six, uh, day seven human embryo. And uh, what Jenny has done is uh, removed the outer cell layers of the embryo, which is here. And then what you're left with is this little tiny ball in the center. Remember, this, these contain the cells that will give rise to the embryo. And then what Jenny has done is she's basically associated all the cells and plated them out. And then what you get is uh, individual cell colonies, which we can uh, keep in the lab and keep them growing for very, very long periods of time to study and give us ideas of what actually happens uh, during the early stages of human embryonic development. So to summarize what I've told you so far, and uh, to kind of keep everybody in the loop, um, the stem cells uh, remain in their undifferentiated state, at least embryonic stem cells with this pluripotency can form all the cell types of the embryo. We derive embryonic stem cells from embryos. We can do it in mouse, we can do it in human. We can also do it in a lot of other different species as well. Um, the early stage human stem cells are derived from IVF, surplus IVF embryos. But what we can also do now is derive the induced pluripotent stem cells, as I mentioned before, skin cells. And naturally, because of this, stem cells hold a great amount of promise for regenerative medicine and in our purposes to study human development development and to treat diseases. Um, so now I want to move a little bit on to understanding and uh, demonstrating what the wind pathway is um, and how it regulates uh, as a form of cell communication. Um, but before I kind of do that, I thought it would be a nice idea just to very quickly run through the anatomy of a cell um, because it's quite important for the next part of the talk. Um, so this is a very widely accepted image of the cell. And for the last you know 50 years or so, there's been minor tweaks and um, to it, we've developed our understanding of the cell and 
generally a lot of what you see here hasn't really changed a whole lot apart from the more finer details but the the main parts i would really kind of like to draw your attention to is the outside of the cell it has this orange uh somewhat of a barrier really but it's not per se a barrier this is what we call the plasma membrane and this kind of separates the inside of the cell and all of its kind of constituents from the extra from the from the uh, environment and the outside is what we call the extracellular environment um and this uh purpley blotch here um is the nucleus and inside the nucleus contains what we call chromatin or in smaller forms it's the dna basically the dna is the blueprints of the cell it's the blueprints of any organism and the really important part about this is that in your dna uh, which is kind of condensed onto 46 chromosomes. So you, you have 23 over two pairs. Uh, you get one half from mum, one half from dad. Um, and what we have is the, the DNA, and then there are long tracts of DNA, um, which are regions for what we call genes. And these genes code for proteins, and the proteins are the effectors of uh, the cell. And they basically... Uh, tell the cell what to do is kind of the bottom short of it, really. Um, so in terms of the wind pathway, which I'll go on in the next slide to describe, it's a form of signaling. And this is a method by which cells communicate with each other. So what cells will effectively do is they create these proteins and they push them out into the environment that's surrounding the cells. The signaling molecules, also known as ligands, bind to receptors, which are more proteins on the surface of the cell. And then we get a transduction cascade through the cell, and then it activates a response generally within the nucleus. Now, not all receptors are found on the surface. There are examples of some receptors, uh, mainly uh, receptors that transduce the sex hormones. They're actually found on the inside of the cell. But generally what these are doing is they are communicating signals from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. That's the main kind of branch of it. So the wind pathway, as I mentioned briefly before, is something I'm quite very, very interested in, and it's evolutionarily conserved uh, all the way back around about 380 million years ago. So if we go back 380 million years ago to very uh, somewhat simplistic organism compared to modern day, um, organisms, you find the rudimentary um, aspects of wind signaling still exists. So what's changed is that throughout evolutionary time, things have got a lot more complex. Um, and a lot of the work that was originally done on the wind pathway, at least in this initial discovery, was uh, done by Roland Nusser and uh, at the time was his uh, supervisor and then collaborator, Harold Varmus. Um, and the discovery of the wind protein comes from two separate lines of, of evidence and they both merged at the same time. So uh, Roland Nussa during his very, very early work as a PhD and early postdoc student was very interested in understanding how breast cancer forms uh, via mammary tumours in the mouse. And basically what he sh uh, showed was that a, a retrovirus, MMTV, the member of the family, uh, was involved in uh, causing these mutations in the uh, in mammary cells and basically what happens is you get the formation of cancer and then when he went away and sequenced the genome and looked closer he actually found that this int1 locus was responsible for it and it's mutated in uh, mammary tumors and basically the, uh, the, the protein codes for the actual ligand that binds to the receptor but because it was so highly expressed in these cells he found that actually it was involved in uh, development of the uh, mammary tumours. At the same time, there was work done in the Drosophila um, that if you remove the, the, the other protein that's found in fruit flies, DINT1, you actually get fruit flies that are wingless. They don't have any wings at all. And then it was later shown that these form uh, morphogen gradients that are involved in um, patterning the fruit fly. And so what actually happened was that these two discoveries came together. And so int and then uh, the wingless, which is what it was called in the Drosophila, they were found to be homologous of each other. So they're the same proteins, but they just have slightly different functions. And then the word wint was born. And then from there, the whole field exploded, really. And it was actually, uh, from what I've read of accounts from both uh, Roller and Harold, uh, the, the, the field was uh, it just exploded, really, and it was fantastic.
And then a lot of work went into mapping the pathway, which I'll describe in the next few slides. And then if we come to more modern um, times, a lot of focus has been pushed on to trying to purify these proteins because they really actually don't like to be outside of the cell for too, for too long. And it makes it quite difficult to discover, uh, to, to work with, sorry, shall I say. Um, but in the 1970s, around about the same time as uh, Rola Nusa and Harold Vormis were working on the wind pathway, um, Eric and Christine both made a very interesting discovery that actually an, um, a downstream protein of the wind pathway called in fruit flies armadillo and in uh, humans uh, beta catenin and other mammals uh, was involved in the pathway. And this excerpt from Eric uh, is quite is quite nice actually. So the, the, the name comes from a series of wind screen, uh, screening experiments that were done in the 1970s, which generated fruit fly larvae with mutant cuticles. Uh, the cuticles are just part of the, the fruit fly. You can actually see them here and then these, the bands and the mutants. Um, and basically when you remove the, uh, the wingless protein, uh, sorry, the, arm, uh, the armadillo, my apologies, um, basically what happens is you get this, uh, these bands and they, they, they look like uh, an armadillo, or at least this is what Eric uh, thought at the time. Um, and, you know, back in the day, fruit fly names were basically named after their, their phenotypes. So, you know, there's some really cool, crazy genes that are named the, the Halloween genes, for example, or um, cheap date, that is the name of a gene. And if you mutate it in Drosophila, they become incredibly um, sensitive to uh, ethanol, alcohol, and they get drunk, basically. That's why it's called cheap date. Um, and basically at the time, Eric just thought that this was the name that they wanted to give it. And so basically it stuck. Um, and so did a lot of the original Drosophila names. But nowadays uh, we stick to the original genomes which makes it a little bit more complex. Um, so the actual pathway itself is, is remarkably complex. And, and so what I wanted to do was just to show a, some of a simplified version to kind of demonstrate my point. Um, so the, this, is, this is the cell um, and basically cells are competent to respond and to receive these wind signals. And they do so via um, the plasma membrane uh, receptors. So this is what we call the frizzled um, and LGR. And then there's this other receptor called LRP. The, the main gist of this part of the, the network is the fact that armadillo, or as I said, in humans and, and other mammals, the beta catenin, in cells that aren't activated by wind, this protein is uh, constitutively degraded. So it's, it's broken down within the cells. And it's a good thing that it is because it's so highly produced that if it's not broken down, then the pathway becomes uh, activated uh, too quickly. It has to be done in a very regulated manner. Uh, this represents the nucleus. And inside we have these terminal effector proteins. These are what we call transcription factors, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail on the next slide. And these are interacting with DNA and these tell the cells what to do and what proteins to produce as a result of the wind protein. So in the activated form, the wind protein binds to both frizzled and LRP. We get as the complex of all these proteins are uh, sequestered. So they're uh, brought up to the plasma membrane. And basically what this does is this liberates beta catenin from its uh, uh, breaking down from its degradation. It enters the nucleus and then we get all this new kind of gene transcription, which then drives uh, fate. Uh, specification or stem cell self renewal. There's a lot of different things it can do. And it's important to note that in most mammals, so if we're talking about uh, humans, mice, primates, and all the other mammals that you can think of, there are generally 19 wind proteins, 10 frizzled receptors, and then there's four of these uh, transcription factors. So there's a wide range of diversity. And one massively open question in the field is how cells can respond to such a diverse amount of signal. So in the 1980s, a very important discovery was made because it's interesting to go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, but then the signal has to go from the, the membrane to the nucleus. And it's an interesting question of how does it do this and how does it integrate this? So work done by Marion Waterman um, and Hans Klevers at the uh, Utrecht Uni uh, Institute in uh, Amsterdam, Holland. Uh, basically demonstrated that these uh, TCF factors uh, are important for this. 
Um, and as I mentioned, transcription factors are these specialist proteins that interact with the DNA directly and they regulate what genes need to be turned on and turned off. So, for example, if we take a stem cell and we want to make a muscle cell or a liver cell, then we turn on the genes that we want for the muscle cell, but we turn off the ones for the liver cell. And that's really, really important. Conversely, if we want to make a liver cell, we turn the liver cells on, but we turn the muscle cell genes off. And that's also just as important. If you don't do that, then the cells don't fade to the right lineage. They don't form the right kind of cells. And what you get are a bit of a mix, really, or you don't get the cell at all. Um, the original TCF left factors were actually found in immune cells. And this is where they're called T cell factor and lymphoid and Hansen factor. They're originally from the blood cells, the immune cells. The long and short of it is basically is that they have this kind of a wide range of evolutionary conserved domains. And then the armadillo beta catenin protein, which I described in the previous slides, binds to this region of the protein and its binding is absolutely important. Uh, these two figures here, uh, these two diagrams here, demonstrate evolutionary conservation. So these are all different um, uh, organisms. The C. elegans is a worm, uh, D. melagaster is the fruit fly, and this is Homo sapiens, which are humans. And what you can see, at least in this um, region here, is that there is a hell of a lot of conservation, even though that humans, or at least the ancestors of humans a long, long time ago, uh, with common ancestor of worms and flies, they all share this evolutionary conservation. And again, another interesting question is how these have changed through evolutionary time from simpler organisms all the way up to humans, and how these are implicated in disease development, stem cell self-renewal. So it's interesting to understand how wind signaling proceeds. And a lot of work has then been done in understanding embryos. Um, because human embryos are quite difficult to somewhat obtain, they're only really obtained from IVF. Research on primates, especially in the greater primates, such as um, chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, is completely banned. We, over the, uh, over the decades, have used the mouse embryo as a, a model to understand mammalian embryonic development. Um, and what I would like to show here um, is that if we remove the WIND3 protein from the mouse embryo. So this is a mouse embryo at uh, around about six and a half days of embryonic gestation. Um, and what you can see here in the center is a lumen. And then this here is the cells that are gonna go on to form the actual embryo itself. And the, the blue regions of each of these embryos uh, shows the expression of the genes. This is a normal embryo and what it should look like. And this is what on the right is what happens when we remove the WIND protein. So when we remove WIND3 from these embryos, we lose this expression. Um, T uh, brachyuri is a gene that's very, very important for gastrulation. It's important for the development of the, the embryonic germ layers, so forming the, the guts, the, the uh, you know, lungs, uh, the liver and things like that. And if we, oops, if we remove um, the wind protein, at least wind three, we lose brachyuri and we lose other kinds of markers that are associated with wind signaling. So what we know from this is that wind signaling coordinates these events and it's very, very important. If you remove parts of the wind pathway, if you remove its receptivity, its ability to communicate, it ends up in what we call embryonic lethality and actually ends gestation. And um, this is kind of a homologous event that would occur in humans is this would probably result in a miscarriage uh, of what we call um, uh, pregnancy cessation. Um, however, to understand this in the human embryo, as I mentioned, is very, very difficult, not only to obtain embryos, but also because um, embryos in humans implant very far into the endometrium lining, and it's just not ethical to retrieve those embryos to understand this. So in terms of wind signaling and stem cell biology, we know that wind signaling is involved in uh, the, uh, the maintenance of mouse stem cells that I've shown you before. Um, that was work that was done quite a while ago. Um, as part of my PhD and my area of research, we're trying to understand what the roles of wind signaling is, uh, at least this form of communication in uh, human embryonic stem cells. But what we do know straight off the bat is that too much wind is bad for the cells and they differentiate uh, into these flattened cells and take on a different phase. 
Um, so this is one aspect of my PhD and the other aspect of my PhD is understanding how wind signaling affects early embryonic development in the human embryo. But also there's stem cells, like I mentioned before, in the adult, and these are all kind of very niche and you find them in lots of different parts of the, um, the body. So the, the intestines is a really good example, the liver, the heart, the brain, the eye, the teeth. And these are very, very important for the regenerative capacity of the organs. So the intestines is highly regenerative. Cells only live for four days, um, but because the intestines are involved in uh, you know, digestion and absorption, it's a very harsh environment. So regeneration needs to be uh, you know, optimally maintained. And wind signaling actually uh, is involved in this. So if we have a closer look at the example of the intestines, um, what we actually see in the gross uh, uh, anatomy of the intestines is that actually we have these, what we call villi, um, which are these protrusions that are involved in the absorption of nutrients. And if we have a closer look at the cellular structure of these cells, uh, of these villi, sorry, at the very bottom here where we demarcate the, the, what we call the crypts of the, of the, uh, of the villi, uh, nestled in here are stem cells. And if we look even closer, the, the, these special cells, these mesenchymal cells, which are supportive, and what they're actually doing is secreting, uh, releasing wind proteins into the environment, which maintain these stem cells here. And so basically, they allow for a controlled uh, regeneration of the, stem, of the stem cell population and a controlled regeneration of the intestine all the way through adult life and through the lifetime of any organism. And what we know is that actually, if we mutate or we uh, uh, re like remove the function of wind proteins in the intestines at this stage, at least in mice, uh, mice die very, very quickly when they're born because their intestines can't regenerate. And actually, if you look at histological sections of mice, uh, mouse uh, intestines, you see that there are no villi at all. And because of this, we can generate these really, really cool things called organoids. And we do this uh, by removing cells from a biopsy. We can do this from lots of different tissues. Actually, we can even do this from uh, the venom glands of snakes now, believe it or not. And what we do is we take the normal tissue, we dissociate it, and then we place it into um, a special matrix with all the growth factors that are required. And what you get are these um, very highly organized structures um, that resemble the intestines. We can do it with liver, brains, you name it, we can do it. And this has been really instrumental for treating things like cystic fibrosis. Um, and so what one can do is take uh, these cells and um, grow the organoids from cystic fibrosis patients. You can take them directly from their, from their intestines, grow them up in the lab, these organoids, and then you can treat them with a chemical called for scrolling. And basically what this does is it causes the organoids to expand. So in this case here on the left, these are um, cystic fibrosis um, organoids from patients. And when you give them for scrolling, they don't actually expand. But actually, if you go in and um, uh, treat the organoids with a, a, a small molecule um, drug, that's involved in treating cystic fibrosis, or if we use genome editing to repair the cystic fibrosis gene that's involved, we actually get this expansion. And so basically this kind of paves the way for something what we call personalized medicine. So in the future, you might be able to go to your GP, give a biopsy, they go away, they send them to the lab, the lab grows up these organoids, and we basically test drugs to tell you which drugs are gonna work and which ones aren't, which ones are the best for patients because everyone's genetics are so different. So this is really, really cool. And this is where the field is kind of going. So to summarize this, um, we see that wind is really, really important for this. It's involved in health and disease and embryonic development. That the, the communication of wind is mediated by this beta catenin protein, the armadillo protein that I showed you. But the most important thing is that it's in tight control at all times. We know that it's involved in human development. We know that it's involved in mammalian development and mouse, I've shown you this before and that uh, it's helping us to guide scientists uh, towards treatments for infertility, cancer, and degenerative diseases. But whilst wind signaling maintains the long longevity of these cells, these stem cells in the organs, what happens when this becomes dysregulated? So to go back to the original slide of showing you what the stem cells are, remember that these stem cells can remain undifferentiated or they can differentiate. And then sometimes when cells be stem cells become uh, over proliferative, so they divide too much. One mechanism that 
the, uh, the environment deals with this is by causing them to differentiate because when they differentiate, their lifespan becomes locked in, whereas a stem cell can renew for the lifetime of an organism or in the lab for indefinitely. So what actually happens is, and I kind of hope you might be able to piece this together yourselves, is that when stem cells become aberrant in their communication, they don't control it. Developmental biology and cancer biology start to become two sides of the same coin. So this is a wheel of basically all of the different uh, characteristics. Um, I would pay too much attention to the outside. That's just the inhibitors. But the inside are hallmarks of cancers. Um, and they can evade, uh, you know, uh, growth suppressors so they can continuously grow. They resist cell death. So when a cell, when its DNA becomes damaged, one of the things that cells do is they undergo this thing called apoptosis um, or cell program death. And that's really important because that removes these uh, unwanted and uh, potentially cancerous. They induce angiogenesis, which is basically where they start to develop blood vessels so they can feed cancer cells. But this all stems from over proliferation of the cells. So how does wind actually do this? So one really important thing and difference of wind uh, communication is that during embryonic development, it's transient. So it comes on and then goes off very, very quickly. And it's very tightly regulated. And that's absolutely important because the speed of development is very, very quick. Cells need to be differentiated. They need to know where they're going. So it needs to be quick. However, that mechanism is absolutely not compatible with stem cells. Stem cells need a slightly elevated or um, an attenuated level of prolonged wind signaling to maintain their ability to self-renew. So I would like to think at this stage, you might be able to see this implication that actually um, too much wind is bad for the cells. And this is where we start to actually get cancers forming. So whilst wind is really important for embryonic development, really important for maintaining stem cells, it's also really bad in the sense that it can form and lead to cancer. So it's important that we recognize that the wind communication that cells have between each other is controlled intrinsically by themselves. And in one case where this kind of goes completely skew with, it goes completely out of proportions, is in colorectal carcinomas, so cancer, or bowel cancer, basically. And 80% of all bowel cancers have a mutation in this gene called APC. Um, and APC, uh, if you remember from the previous slides, but at least more simplified here, is involved in maintaining beta catenin's uh, degradation or its breakdown. And so what it's doing is it's lowering it, it's maintaining it, it's keeping it within a threshold. When you um, lose APC's function, beta catenin becomes regulated and it becomes stabilized and it goes to the nucleus and controls genes that it's not really supposed to do. And it starts to regulate genes that are involved in growth and um, evading cell death. And that's when you start to get the initiation of early stage uh, cancers. It's hyperproliferation, hyperactivation of the pathway, something what we call hyperplasia, where we get lots and lots of cells that are to, to the dividing. And it's important to note that because APC in the cell is downstream of the plasma membrane, downstream of this level, the uh, control of the cell, the control of its signaling pathway is completely lost entirely. But it's important to also note that cancer development is a continuum. It takes a long time generally for cancers to develop, um, at least in adults uh, that we know of. Uh, cancers can take two, three, five, up to 10 years to actually manifest in itself. Um, things like pancreatic adenocarcinomas, for example, um, you know, when things like you start to get diabetes or other kind of uh, insulin related pathologies, this is from a later stage cancer when cancer is relatively untreatable. But here between the cancer, uh, so the initiation in the intestine, um, between the normal lining of the intestine to where we get this hyperproliferation, here's APC2. And then as we move along through cancer, and then we actually get a colon carcinoma, where then it becomes metastatic. So when the cancer cells actually begin to metastasize to other organs, we see that these cells start to actually accumulate more and more mutations. So KRAS mutation, which is involved in FGF uh, signaling, which is another form of cellular communication. P53, which is a protein that's involved in um, regulating the genome uh, from apoptosis. 
you can see that over time, the cancer is a continuum and that actually uh, it takes a long time for it to develop. But on the horizon, there are treatments. And from our, our studying of the wind pathway, we've been able to really start to understand how we can target each of these individual um, parts of the pathway. So as I mentioned before, wind proteins are released into the um, outside of the cell and um, they don't like it there. And the amazing, the, the, the reason for this is, is, is this little tiny uh, part of the wind protein is a fatty acid tail and it doesn't like being in an environment where there's lots of uh, water basically. And so we can kind of block this, but the real problem with this method is that when we start to block wind signaling globally, uh, it has uh, it has off target effects. So um, these porcupine inhibitors, uh, known as porcin, um, whilst they block wind in cancers, they also block wind that's involved in bone homeostasis, for example. So uh, people undergoing cancer treatments for wind related uh, cancers start to um, have problems with their uh, gastrointestinal system. Uh, the bones, osteoporosis, and things like that. So we're trying to understand how things, uh, how these treatments can become more selective and, and more targeted. But on on the note of um, the porcupine and how it regulates the uh, the exit of wind proteins from the cells, um, there is one notable condition called focal derma hyperplasia or Gold syndrome which is caused by this disrupted wind communication. And the really, really quite interesting thing about this is the fact that the, the, the gene is located on the X chromosome. So um, females have two X chromosomes, males have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. The, the Y or the extra X chromosome in the female comes from um, the father. He determines the sex of the baby, of the, of the embryo, the fetus. Um, and because this is X related, um, it's interesting because what we see now is actually that, that males, uh, human males, uh, with a germline mutation. So uh, a germline mutation is basically passed down from uh, through the embryo. It's it's not in the cells of the adult um, or not found at all. And actually, this actually primarily affects females. Um, so this is something really interesting and it's definitely something worth uh having a look into a little bit more in the future and seeing if there's some more some more treatments because yeah a lot of skin conditions arise from this and we get uh, congenital abnormalities of the limbs and uh, missing toes and oligodactyly and, and that sort of thing um so that's kind of really the end of the talk um and what i kind of hope to uh, um have demonstrated is that the wind pathway this communication and cells and embryos and stem cells really is kind of a pandora's box and the reason why i titled the talk a Pandora's box um, is the fact uh, from from the the you know the Greek mythology and things like this of, of Pandora's boxes that it's a it's a source of great but also an unexpected troubles. But I think a, a much better um, interpretation of this is that it's a, it's a gift or a present which seems valuable but is in reality a curse. And I think um, for me personally, I do kind of view the wind pathways that it's important for all of these different mechanisms, but it can also be a curse. So. To kind of summarize everything that I've talked about today, uh, the, formula, the formulation of communication via wind signaling regulates both embryonic development and stem cells, uh, but unchecked control leads to death of the embryo and uh, degenerative diseases and cancers. Uh, the, the wind driven cancers, are, there's lots of treatments for them and we're making more and more better treatments uh, every, every day and the research is, is really pioneering for this. Um, but there is naturally a massive and significant requirement to understand more in depth, which is what some of my research is doing and uh, other people around the world. So just to acknowledge very quickly, uh, we have to say thank you to Jenny for letting me join her lab and for all of her support and uh, being in such a supportive environment from the lab itself. Uh, a big thank you to my course supervisor, Stefan Hobler from the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he's been really instrumental for helping me with working out what Wynn's doing. Um, to the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute where I work and thank you also to um, the MRC for funding this research and again thank you to the organisers for giving me the chance to give this talk and that's it. Great, thank you so much Connor for an amazing talk. Uh, just, just a quick reminder to uh, those listening that if you do have any questions please post them in the chat and in fact there seems to be one there already from Nick Alcock who is asking about the embryonic cells that were in too much wind.
that looked like they were almost epithelial. Yeah. Do we know what lineage they've been forced down yet? Uh, he suggests perhaps intestinal epithelium? Uh, so yes, actually we do. We do know he's uh, really quite simply um, what these cells are. So um, when I was describing at the beginning of the talk, the, the embryo, um, and uh, you have the cells around the outside, the trophoblast cells, which go on to form the placenta, very, very important cells, of course. Um, <laughs> the inside, the little ball of cells that we create, that we generate uh, the stem cells from, they contain two types of cells. So the epiblast progenitors, which go on to form the fetus, and then underlying is a little tiny band of cells called hyperblast cells, and they're really important for patterning the embryo, uh, basically telling what's going to be its head and what's going to be its arse. Um, and then they form the yolk sac. So actually in the human system more so, um, if we take the stem cells and we give them too much wind or we kind of cause hyperactivation of the wind signaling or a little bit more than what's uh, necessarily controlled by the cells, we actually see that they adopt this hyperblast-like cell fit. Um, so they don't quite form intestinal stem cells or in, uh, any form of intestines. That would have to be done a lot later on in, in, in development of the stem cells to make those cells. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I think I want to take it back a couple of steps. So throughout the talk, you mentioned wind in a number of contexts a number of times. I was wondering if you give a little bit more detail or maybe a bit more context in how wind changes within different cell types and why it's differentially regulated in that way. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the main, uh, the main premise of the, the wind signaling pathway as a form of ancient communication is indeed how individual cells can interpret the signals basically. Um, and there's m many, many layers by which the cells can actually do this. Um, so. Uh, if we have the actual protein docking and binding with the receptor, the cell knows that this is happening. And so it will regulate the level of free receptors that the protein can bind to. The increase in the beta catenin and the armadillo protein, and then its activation within the nucleus is then also regulated by the cell. So there are many different um, levels of regulation. Um, another layer of regulation that these cells can do, which is also quite amazing, is that actually the cells can um, produce more proteins which bind to the wind proteins on the outside of the cell. And basically they bind in such a way that they block its binding to the receptor. And so regardless of the overall kind of amount of wind outside of the cell, the cell can effectively stop too much of the of the of the uh, signals, and when you start to get um, dysfunctionality of specific proteins within the cell, is when you start to get too much activation of the pathway, and you get cancer, over proliferation, and cell fates that you don't want really. Yeah, makes sense. I think as well, one of the, the more interesting contexts you you mentioned were organoids. And, yeah, uh, they're always incredibly interesting as if you just look at them, they don't often look like the organ they represent and yet they act so much like them. So you already touched on it a little about their application, particularly for targeted treatment. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts on organoids? It's particularly for the study of Wnt. Um, so like all model organ, like models, you know, that come from stem cells and things like that, they all have their, their limitations. There's always something you know that can be improved on, and this is the wonderful thing about science is that it's constantly improving. Um, and a model that was wrong, you know, or not so optimal 20 years ago, can be improved. Um, organoids are really fantastic, um, and the and the fact that they can do a lot of really cool things. Um, I think one very important thing that these uh, organoids can recapitulate is their 3D environment to a certain extent. Uh, you know, cells generally act in a 3D way, in a 3D way they can constantly in contact with each other. One of the limitations of this is the fact that organoids don't have support from other cells. So we don't have immune cells, we don't have innovation, we don't have those sort of things. So it's a kind of a line where we have to stop. Um, organoids have been really instrumental for studying wind signaling, absolutely. Um, 
we know that wind signaling is really important for the for generating organoids. It really makes no difference as to what tissue they come from, uh, whether they are, um, you know, cerebral organoids or um, sorry, organoids that come from the brain, uh, organoids that are coming from the lung, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, uh, the prostate, uh, the uterine lining, the fluid, you name it. As long as there's some cells that can regenerate and repurpose their stem cells, we can take them out and we can uh, derive the organoids. And as I mentioned in the talk, you know, Hans Klaver's lab, who discovered the TCF left transcription factors, very recently showed that they can actually make organoids from uh, snake venom glands. So they take this, the cells from um, these venom ducts within the snake, and wind is the main protein that's required for this. And then you basically make these organoids that produce venom. And this is amazing because we can use these organoids to study uh, the toxins of venom, but also if there's any molecules that could have um, efficacy in treating diseases, um, but also for anti-venoms for when people get bit by them. So the, the, the applications of organoids are really quite amazing. And for, for studying wind signaling, but not only just wind signaling, other pathways, they have uh, been tremendous, really.